I think there's a bunch of leaders that have come out of uh, Indeca, where Steve led, have gone on to do some interesting things. And I'm curious, in terms of talent, what do you think Boston needs to do to be relevant, to be competitive, to be innovative, to just kick ass? Well, there's plenty that can be done. We're doing a lot of great things now. But if we go back to 10 years ago, when um, we sold Indeca, and I'm trying to figure out what to do, all of the venture capitalists and the other members of the community were all upset and, frankly, complaining that there's nothing interesting going on in Boston. You should go to Silicon Valley. Literally, that's what they were saying. I even went and visited Silicon Valley, spent some time. Actually, the Andreessen folks wanted me to be one of their investment partners, spent a few weeks there. And um, they wanted me to, to become a partner there. And I said, fine, but I'm living in New England. And they're like, well, we, we need everyone here in Silicon Valley. And so you know, I went and stayed doing my thing here. But my response to that back then was, why go to Silicon Valley? Why don't we try to create great things here? Why don't we roll up our sleeves and just do things? That was literally the attitude. I launched six companies with, from a whiteboard you know, with entrepreneurs, some my ideas, some their ideas, some a blend, all that kind of stuff. And it's nice that one is already very visible as an iconic success here in Boston, that we actually delivered on that somewhat um, bold, audacious statement, let's just do it, right? And we did. And, um, you know, and then the question is how we're going to do more of that. And it's not just the companies I was involved in launching. There are other members of my team that are doing great things. There's the Salsify team, which is quite notable um, in Boston. They recently you know, sold to a large private equity firm. And, and many others. But what happened, you know, the way I tell the story, as we were building in DECA, we, we, we located the cross street from MIT. Literally, we were in Kendall Square because we wanted to be where there was great folks to be on our team. They were supposed to put mission control there. That's 70 right. 70 acres, never got built, ended up going to Texas for some strange reason. And there was all this <laughs> land and a lot of startups like yours. Yeah. Well, when there. we started there, it was still mostly parking lots. Yeah. It's changed radically in the past 20 years. When we got to about 200 people, we struggled to get the best talent on the team. They were like, you're too big. All the hard problems are solved. That you know, was a usual you know, uh, refrain. And so we created a team called Special Operations that reported to me. And the idea was we'd recruit folks that had the sort of, sort of more comfort of a larger organization with more resources, but they'd get to do very entrepreneurial things. They reported to me. We'd throw hard problems at them. These were the folks that when they interview, they want to be told they're going to get hard stuff, right? One of the products we were trying to figure out how to take to market related to complex analytics, where we'd go into a company, they'd give us lots of data, and we'd have to develop a product out of it, effectively an application, and figure out how to create value for that company. The team built many, many of these applications, and each one of them was an exercise in product market fit. Like, literally, they'd go through it every few weeks. They'd be going through it again. And that skill set, I'm convinced, was what we inadvertently taught many folks that allowed them to become successful entrepreneurs. Karate kid, wax on, wax yeah, on. Yeah, in a sense, absolutely, right? So we had 25 people on that team over the years. They were mo usually right out of school, but not always. But it was a certain profile of someone insanely curious who wanted hard problems, would work very hard. And the hit rate is something like two-thirds of the folks that were on that team became venture-backed CEOs or founders. So it really, really worked. And I'm, I spend a lot of my time thinking how to scale that up. That's a lot of the stuff I'm working on now. But that was a, that was a critical element. The talent that you recruited, how did you signal that, that, this, that they could thrive? And, and, and what, did, what did they see that was in it for them? Because I think if you're going to get talent uh, to grow and develop, they need to believe that it's worth it. How did you create that kind of value proposition? A couple of things. One, these things are somewhat self-selecting, right? What's interested to one profile, interesting to one profile scares the hell out of another profile, mm -hmm. right, of, of individual, right? This is the, if you want the extreme version, is someone that pursues a career in law, the level of certainty and rate of change versus swing the pendulum the other way to crazy entrepreneurship where things are changing every day, okay? So that's the first thing. So you could screen people just by being very open with the type of things going on. Number two, the first few folks kind of were inside the company already. 
So there was someone they could talk to the types of things they were doing. They were they were they, they were recognized. They, yeah, they were very I strong like performers on the team that didn't have the right spot they were excited to, to do in a normal organizational structure. So they wanted to be involved in this type of activity. So people had someone to look up to, right? That, you know, that really helps. And more often than not, once one person was involved, in fact, with the Toast team, there was one person who joined, um, and then he brought along his friend, who was Steve Fredette, who was one of the Toast founders. They had actually uh, famously tried to compete with Facebook Facebook wanted them to join, and they were kind of like, screw you, <laughs> so we're doing our own thing, we're competing with you. So at least the one who joined, who founded Toast, finally can have his, his victory, having walked yeah. away from being probably in the first 10 people at Facebook. And then he brought another friend, which joined the team, yeah. right? And so, and then he brought his twin brother, and like, it's just that sort of thing. They, they tend to have others that they know, and. So what is Boston's competitive advantage and competitive disadvantage? And then I want to go to, I know you're doing clear ballot, you're doing something with wireless and 5G and hardware, you're, you're, you're doing shoebox, you're doing a bunch of different things. And I don't know if you want to get so much into what you're doing, but what's your strategy to pick opportunities? And, and I think you're just getting started. Um, so, so, so two questions, competitive disadvantage and competitive advantage for the region, and then, well, then how, well, how are you filling your portfolio for activities? Well, let's start with the competitive advantage is the human capital in Boston is, you know, insane. It's like, tr it's tremendous. Um, Fish in a barrel. Yes, there's so many talented people that come through here, which leads to the liability, which is they come through and they often go somewhere else, okay? A very concise example of this is, I, I remember I'd, I'll do dinners at one of the universities for students or whatever, and they'll say things like, are there any interesting tech companies in Boston? They show up, they get off at the airport, go to school, go to some clubs, <laughs> go back to school and get back in the airport and go. And we don't market what's happening here, right? Where people can see it. Like I, I, what I've said to more than one governor of the state is we let the Red Sox have their pennants or you know, the Celtics in the airport why can't the jetways be lined with the logos of all the dynamic companies that are growing you know, in, this, in the state, yeah. right? That's, that's the right. gateway. Logan so, is the gateway. So in, in terms of the things you're interested in, how are you choosing? Like, is there a pattern to all those well, things? Well, at the time, I was going after what the venture capitalists wouldn't go after. I'm not going to chase what 50 other people are chasing. I'm going to try to do the things that are important and need to be done and just focus on making it successful. It was a view that, you know, instead of momentum investing into something and competing with, you know, bigger, bigger piles of capital, it was look for things that need to exist, build them, that creates a base case, and if we're lucky, we'll figure out a go-to-market to get escape velocity. Toast certainly hit that escape velocity, right? I mean, I did two chip companies. No one was touching chip companies back then. And I'm like, chip companies are gonna be the scarce asset, and it's not like chips aren't important. They're the engine that drives all this stuff, right? So important advancements, like you know, we're in it 10 years and two of the chip companies and they're just now hitting their stride because we are solving a problem that is only gonna get worse and now it's becoming apparent. And one just figured out distribution, it's not announced, but they have a very large chip company. One of the big consumer brands of chips we all know, let's put it that way. And they're gonna distribute their chip for them, right? And so it's gonna be huge, they'll go public next year. But that's the sort of stuff. I went for things that were important to do, that I felt I could contribute in some way, and weren't of interest to venture capitalists. Yep. So the Toast story, that just happened. Tell us something we don't know about that story. You know, we, why, why couldn't they raise money early days? They have to do with uh, the product, the pitch, and uh, are you surprised that they were so successful? You know, in the pandemic, restaurants were sort of hurting. Uh, you know, Grubhub was doing well, uh, you know. Well, let's set aside the pandemic, because really their success story, I mean, there's, there's two success stories. There's the run up to it, and then it was, you know, navigating that. But they were already very successful prior. There was a venture capitalist here um, when I was having breakfast who ran, came by and said, congratulations, we passed on it five times. <laughs> you know, that's, and it was one of this person's partners who said early on, it's too hard to sell the restaurants, and it's a crowded market. Now, the too hard to sell the restaurants, it's very, it is very hard. 
But the crowded market's also an opportunity. And, 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 how, and how many restaurants? 50,000? They have 50,000. Yeah, yeah, so they did today. figure out how to do it. And that's going to keep doing yeah. this, right? Yeah. Most people don't understand what, made, what Toast derives success from. It's not a technology innovation. There's like, do you have any idea what their innovation is? Point of sale. I mean, uh... their innovation is in distribution channel. Yeah. What Toast did in this very crowded market. So when when tablets came out, suddenly anyone could introduce you know a touch screen, which is used in a in a retail environment. But the problem is they couldn't get it out there. So they'd partner with the payments companies, the folks that sell credit card processing, so that they would call up and say, oh, this restaurant's opening. You know, they need a point of sale, and they try to introduce them. The net result, and then they'd be a local installer. And by the time you did all that, the person making the software was probably seeing a third of the revenue that's flowing, and the restaurant's spending all that money. What Toast saw was if instead they embedded the payments into the system, they, were, they not only could lower the price to the restaurant, but generate enough margin to afford a direct distribution channel, that they could build a team of folks here in Boston, in you know, all these big cities, selling and servicing, because these restaurants need help. Right? They need help with training, et cetera. And the way I talk about it, they opened up a wormhole to disrupt the industry. They raced through that wormhole, made a lot of good decisions right, around how they took all the capital, they put a lot into technology to build the biggest product footprint. And at some point, that footprint's big enough and their distribution's big enough, that wormhole's closed. It's really hard for someone else to go through it. And now they have to be sure that they're thinking, what are other wormholes someone else can create for further disruption and make sure they're defending, you know, that, you know, because they, they're in a position, they can grow to 500,000 restaurants. They can yeah. become 10 times bigger just by keeping doing what they're doing now. Yeah. So last question, uh, with the pandemic, people realize they can work from home in the tech industry. You're talking about Boston has advantages, and you're, you, know, you were recruited out to Boston many times, uh, out to Silicon Valley many times. You kept your companies here, your boss, you're a pro Boston. Coming out of this pandemic, is Boston still going to be uh, relevant to build tech companies? Are you going to want to get a distributed team across the country, across the land, across the world? Well, I, well, first of all, I don't see those as mutually exclusive, right? I think both are true. I think Boston will remain incredibly relevant, and people will be building more distributed teams. When we built Indeca on day one, someone showed up from California, someone from Virginia, someone from New York, and probably four or five folks from Boston. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were all people I, I knew or I found with very specific expertise. Mm -hmm. um, I still, you know, if that were done today, we, those folks probably wouldn't move, but we still would get launched. Now, it'd be an interesting question how, how the innovation process would work, because you do need to bring people together in the innovation process along the way. There's, there are limits to what you can Closing do Closing question, Gen Z, if they want to be great entrepreneurs, what advice do you have to them to, to reach their potential and uh, not be an epic fail? Focus on developing their human capital and not focusing on success. Focus on well, growing their skill set, not what am I getting paid today, am I being valued today, all that stuff. Focus on am I learning, am I on the steepest learning curve I can be on, for as long as I can be. That's the, 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 the one thing that is under your control that, you know, it's cumulative. All those experiences, you get better and better. That's, that's my advice versus how does someone move the fastest in terms of compensation or anything like that. Great, thank you. You guys, Steve Papa, um, <laughs> a, a leading light in the Boston uh, business uh, scene and, and in the tech world, thank you.